Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. So today we wrap up week four, and we really today's lecture is really the most important one of the week because we're going to take the theory that we've been developing and getting comfortable with for the whole week, and we're going to apply it to some modern data and see how it can help us understand what we measure in very short channel MOSFETs. So I want to point out I'm going to be making use of some uh, unpublished analysis and data that came from uh, Amlam Majumdar and Dimitri Antonidis, uh, two of my colleagues, one at MIT and one at IBM, and I'm very grateful that they've allowed me to include this in the uh, in the short course because it will really give us a very nice example of how to use these models. Now I want to point out one other thing. I've, I've been talking throughout the course about virtual source models and I had a level one model and we improved that and added to it and I've been thinking of these virtual source models in a generic way. Now there's also a very specific virtual source model, one that's being developed and has been developed at MIT and which is being widely used and getting a significant amount of recognition. So when I talk about that model, I'll try to be careful and talk about the MIT virtual source model. Essentially it's the same, you know, the same general principles, but there are some additional specifics and differences of notation that it's important to be aware of. So in this lecture, I'm going to be using a lot of that notation that comes out of the MIT virtual source model. So the devices that we're going to be looking at are devices that are being explored at IBM Research. They're extremely thin SOI transistors and channel MOSFETs. Here's a cross-sectional uh, sketch of what the structure looks like. These particular devices are made in unstrained silicon. Uh, the thickness of this extremely thin SOI layer is six nanometers, which is really very, very thin. The thickness of the gate oxide is 1.1 nanometers, which is state of the art. It's about as thin as you can make it without too much tunneling um, leading to too much gate leakage. The measured inversion layer capacitance then, or under uh, on current conditions, is two microfarads per centimeter squared. You know, there's some overlap uh, due to side diffusion. There's some overlap of the gate and the channel. If you subtract out that overlap, you'll find that the shortest devices that we'll be looking at are 30 nanometer physical channel lengths. Okay, and this is just an example of if you fit the MIT virtual source model to the measured data with a range of different channel lengths, this, these are the kinds of fits that can easily be obtained. So this is the attraction of this virtual source model. It contains a relatively small number of physical parameters, but a wide range of devices can be very accurately fit. So it tells us that we're capturing the essential physics in a very sound way, and we don't need a lot of empirical parameters. So here's a summary of some of the model parameters that were taken from this work. Um, I want to point out here that, you know, just some differences in terminology. What's called C gate here is what we've called C inversion in this short course. What's called VT0 here is the, drain, is the threshold voltage under low drain bias. I've called that VT lin. What's called delta here is uh, what I've called dibble, D-I-B-L. So you can see here that in the shortest devices, Dibble is 65 millivolts per volt. It's expressed here in volts per volt. In this particular model, what's called N is what we've called M. Now remember when we talked about MOS electrostatics and we talked about how the voltage dropped between the oxide and the semiconductor, there was this voltage divider ratio M that became important. The subthreshold slope was 2.3 M times KT over Q. So that parameter M is called N in this model, and N is also given a bias dependence. So N prime expresses how N changes with drain bias, and what that is used for is that very often we find that the sub-threshold swing gets worse as you apply a higher drain bias. And to capture that, we simply make this parameter drain bias dependent. So that's what these two parameters, N0 and, and 
N are all about, N prime are all about. Now R E X zero, this is the extrinsic source drain resistance. The zero denotes in the MIT virtual source model, this is the part of the external series resistance that is independent of gate voltage. I've just called that RSD and have really not discussed whether it depends on gate voltage or not. We'll discuss that a little more today. Now, what's called the effective mobility here is actually what I've been calling the apparent mobility. So I've been using the term effective mobility in the way that traditional textbooks use it. It's the average real mobility of electrons in the inversion layer. But in this case, the term effective mobility is going to be used in exactly the same way that we've been using the term apparent mobility. The effective velocity here is the velocity at the top of the barrier, at the virtual source. Okay, so, you know, you always have these things, uh, you know, it's hard for us all to agree on, on uh, terminology. Uh, different people use different terminology, different papers use different terminology. We change our terminology as, as we learn more and more and better ways of doing it. So it's always something that we need to deal with, but if you understand the physics of what's going on, it's easy to make that translation. Okay, let's look at some data and see what we can analyze. So here's the on current for the shortest device. It's 840 microamps per micrometer. Uh, from the virtual source fit, we can deduce the effective velocity or the average velocity at the virtual source. And it's 8.2 times 10 to the sixth centimeters per second. Well, we know that current is width times magnitude of the charge times average velocity at the virtual source. From the measured gate capacitance, we can deduce what the inversion layer density is. In this particular device, it's 6.6 .6 times 10 to the 12th per centimeter squared. Okay, so if I want to compare this measured current to the ballistic current, I need to look at the ballistic injection velocity. And I need to look at that ballistic injection velocity at an inversion layer density of 6.6 .6 times 10 to the 12th. And if we do that, we see that the ballistic injection velocity is 17 times 10 to the 6th centimeters per second. That, in fact, is about twice the deduced velocity at the virtual source, which suggests that we're operating at about half the ballistic limit. Okay, that ratio is controlled by transmission over 2 minus transmission, so we can deduce that for this particular device, the transmission is about 2 thirds. Okay, okay now let, let's switch to mobility. There was actually a, a lot of work done by these authors to measure the mobility as a function of inversion layer charge and channel length under a number of different conditions. And what we're seeing here are the filled square dots. These are mobilities measured in long channel devices for which we don't have to worry about ballistic mobilities or apparent mobilities. We're measuring the real mobility. And if you measure the mobility in the short channel device and you're careful about how you do it, the point of, this of, of these results is you get about the same answer and that it is not strongly dependent on the number of carriers in the inversion layer. So in fact, it is roughly, the real mobility is roughly 330 centimeters squared per volt second. So we could ask, how does that compare to estimated ballistic mobility? And to keep things simple, let's do it in Maxwell Boltzmann statistics. We can simply plug in 30 nanometers, 1.2 times 10 to the seventh centimeters per second for the unidirectional thermal velocity, and we get a ballistic mobility of 690. Okay, so again, we're in a regime where it, it is neither much, much greater nor much, much less than the real mobility. So this device is going to be operating in this quasi-ballistic regime. That's what we expect to see. Okay, now I want to turn for a minute now to series resistance, because this is something we've mentioned and discussed, but it needs a little bit more discussion when you analyze real devices. 
So if I take this IV characteristic, and if I look at the resistance in the linear regime under the maximum gate voltage, say, I'll find that that resistance is the sum of two components. There is what I call the external series resistance, and what the MIT virtual source model calls REX0, or REX. And then there is the actual resistance of the channel. So those two are in series. In the conventional model, you know, we have an expression for the channel resistance. And what this tells us is that if we were to plot R total versus channel length at a fixed gate, uh, gate to source voltage minus VG, then this line, it should give us a straight line. And when you extrapolate, since the channel resistance is proportional to L, if you extrapolate that straight line to zero, you will find the series resistance of the device. That's what the traditional model tells us. Okay. So the idea is that we take this expression and we simply plot it as a function of channel length, extrapolate to zero, and what we find is that series resistance. Okay. Here's the results when you actually do that. When you actually do that, what you'll find is that the series resistance that you extract depends on the inversion layer density or the gate voltage. So what appears to be going on here is that we have a series resistance that is somehow dependent on the gate voltage. At first blush, you would say, well, why is that? You know, the channel resistance should depend on gate voltage, but the channel resistance is proportional to the channel length, and by extrapolating to L equals zero, we've taken all of that out. So we should just get the external series resistance. That is what we're getting, but, uh, or at least, that's part of what we're getting, but it's gate voltage dependent. And let's talk about that a little bit. So to talk about that, we have to think about series resistance. So here's a cross-sectional sketch of this extremely thin SOI device. And here we're zeroing in on the region near the source so that we can look at the pieces of the series resistance. Okay, so if I look at this, there's a component here when the electrons flow in from the source, they have to squeeze down and get into the inversion layer. That's what's known as the inversion layer to, or source drain extension to inversion layer spreading resistance. You know, because the, the current lines have to compress when they go into the inversion layer or when they come out at the drain, drain end, they spread. So that's the component RSP. Now there's another component. The electrons are just flowing through this thin source drain extension. It's very heavily doped, it's as heavily as we can make it, but it has some resistance. So there's some resistance of the source drain extension. We'll call that R sub SDE. And then there is this raised source drain that gives us a heavily doped big region that we can put a contact on and make a low series resistance. So there is some resistance associated with that raised source drain. And then there is some resistance between the metal and the semiconductor. So that is a metal to raised source drain resistance called RC0. Now one might expect a gate voltage dependence of this squeezing process into the inversion layer. So this inversion layer to source drain extension spreading resistance could be gate voltage dependent. And there may be some fringing fields overlapping that are giving me some type of field effect modulation of the electron density in the source drain extension. So there could be some gate voltage dependence of that too. And depending on the device, people actually see these kinds of things. But in this particular device, the authors took some care to estimate what the gate voltage dependence would be. And it turns out that in this case, both of these components have a very small dependence on gate voltage, and the other two components just aren't expected to depend at all on gate voltage. Okay, so we have to figure out what's going on because the data, when we extrapolate total resistance versus length to length equals zero, we find experimentally a gate voltage dependent series resistance, but when we look at this component, we say 
there shouldn't be any significant gate voltage there. So what's going on? Well, we have to look more closely. Our model expresses the linear region current this way. You know, just the part due to the intrinsic device, we're not considering the series resistance here now. So the channel resistance, we can get the channel resistance just by taking one over these terms. The channel resistance is proportional to L and is a one over apparent mean free path. Okay, one over the apparent mean free path is one over, or one over the apparent mobility is one over the real mobility plus one over the ballistic mobility. When I plug that expression in, I'll get a term that is proportional to L over W. And this is the term that we're used to seeing in the traditional model. When I extrapolate to zero, it will remove the channel resistance and that term would disappear. This second term here, this is the added term that comes from ballistic transport. And it involves an L over W and a ballistic mobility. So both of these are gate voltage dependent. Both of them depend on one over the inversion layer density. But this second one is actually independent of channel length. The reason it's independent of channel length is that the ballistic mobility includes a channel length. The two divide out. So what we get for the second term is a channel length independent resistance. It's just the ballistic channel resistance, but it depends on gate voltage. So when we extrapolate L to zero, we'll not only get the external series resistance, we should see the L equals zero ballistic resistance as well, and that's gate voltage dependent. Okay. So when we're doing this kind of thing, um, and we're plotting the total resistance versus channel length, and we're hoping to subtract out the channel resistance part of it, we only subtract out the traditional part of it. We're left with the ballistic channel resistance, and our intercept then will consist of both. So our intercept, we expect to consist of the external gate voltage independent series resistance and the gate voltage dependent ballistic resistance. That explains why when this intercept is deduced experimentally, it shows a gate voltage dependence because we're actually seeing the gate voltage dependence of the ballistic resistance for this device. Now, it's also uh, interesting to look at this and see that when we look at the slope of this line, we're actually getting one over the effective mobility, one over the real mobility. So that's very interesting because we can measure the real mobility and we can deduce the ballistic channel resistance from both of these measurements. All right, key point is that the intercept is the sum of the ballistic channel resistance and the external series resistance. So, you know, in connecting all of this discussion to our virtual source model, you know, you might ask, when you fit this, uh, the, the uh, expression REX0 in the MIT virtual source model, what exactly is that in, in our version of the virtual source model? The answer is that it is the gate voltage independent external series resistance. And in many transistors, that series resistance is gate voltage dependent, independent. What is the mobility? When we're fitting the mobility, the term called mu effective in the MIT virtual source model, this is actually the apparent mobility and involves both the real and the ballistic mobilities. But if we take the slope of the line, R total versus L, we can deduce the real mobility and when we take the intercept at L equals zero, we can deduce the ballistic mobility. So we can get them both from this kind of analysis. Let's see how you would do that. So here's our device. The actual fitting of the MIT virtual source model to this data produces an apparent mobility of 220. When we do these measurements, and when we take the slope of R total versus length, we can extract from the measurements the real mobility. And 
this real mobility is what we're calling the effective mobility, and that's 330. So we can put these two together. The one over the apparent mobility is one over the real mobility plus one over the ballistic mobility. So I can solve for one over the ballistic mobility. The apparent mobility comes from fitting the virtual source model to the data. The effective mobility comes from looking at the total resistance versus channel length and getting the real effective mobility. When you do those two, we can deduce what the ballistic mobility is for this particular device. And it turns out experimentally to be about 660 centimeters squared per volt second. You know, just double the real mobility, so very much on the same order. Okay. Now if we look at what the expected ballistic mobility would be, you know, we could deduce the expected ballistic mobility from our ballistic expression for the current. We get an expression that involves Fermi-Dirac integrals. Um, we can go ahead and go through the numbers and determine where the Fermi level is located and plug numbers in and compute that. If we do that, we get a ballistic mobility that's roughly 500 centimeters squared per volt second. Okay, so the theoretical calculation gives us roughly the same number that we deduce experimentally. And the point of this analysis is that we are seeing when we analyze experimental data of state-of-the-art devices these days, real clear indications of the ballistic mobility and quasi-ballistic transport. And once you have this kind of framework in place that you can sort out these kinds of effects, the measurements make a lot of sense to us. So just to conclude, you know, the uh, virtual source model, especially the MIT version of that model, is very useful for analyzing experimental data. And the point is that this is more than an empirical model. The parameters that we're extracting from this data analysis all have clear physical reasons that can tell us something about the transport and what's happening in this very short channel device. Okay, that brings us to the end of week four. Uh, week five, we have a chance now to think about some other effects, limits of scaling. We'll do a little bit about circuit applications, maybe look at another type of transistor or two. But we have covered a lot of ground in these first four lectures, and I hope what it's given you is a, an understanding that one can understand these very small devices in a simple, clear, physical way that connects in a very nice, direct way to the traditional concepts that MOS people have been using for 40 years or more. So thank you, and I'll look forward to seeing you again in week, uh, week five. <laughs>